Hi, welcome back. In the previous lecture, we learned about sampling techniques and types of sample. So in this presentation, we will look at how the variance increases in the cluster sample and then discuss design effect in cluster sample and rate of homogeneity. We concluded our last lecture by saying that the sampling variance increases in cluster sampling as compared to simple random sampling. All right. Let us try to understand what this means. Understanding the behavior of sampling variance in cluster sampling is important to understand design effect in cluster sampling. We will go through an example to understand this. Say we have a neighborhood with six streets and there are 12 houses on each street. And we would like to know the proportion of houses that do not have a tree in front of it. It is possible that households with higher socioeconomic status would choose to live on streets where there are more trees and nicer, and households with lower socioeconomic status may have to live on streets that do not have many trees and hence less nice and likely less expensive. So here is a neighborhood of six streets with 12 houses on each street. This shows whether there is a tree or not in front of each house. Say we want to know the proportion of houses that do not have a tree in front of it. T stands for tree and NT stands for no tree. We have 72 houses in total. You can now count and we will see that 27 out of the 72 houses do not have a tree in front of it. That is 38%. This is the true population estimate, since we did not sample but studied each of the house on every street. Now let us see what happens to the proportion estimate if you do a cluster sampling. Let us consider each street comprised of 12 houses as a cluster. Then we have 6 clusters. If we want a sample size of 24 houses, then we randomly select 2 streets, with 12 houses on each street two streets would give us our sample of 24 houses. You can sample two streets in many different combinations. I have listed here all the different combinations of streets you will get for sampling two streets and the corresponding calculation for proportion of houses with no trees. There are 15 combinations. That means 15 different samples of two streets. That is 15 sample realizations. Across the 15 sample realizations, we obtain a proportion of 0.375 or 37.5%. So you can see that the average proportion of houses with no trees calculated from the sample realizations is equal to the proportion calculated from the total population. But however, note the variability of the estimates across the 15 clusters. Here is a lot of variation. For example, the proportion varied from a low of 8% for clusters 2 and 5 to a high of 83% for clusters 3 and 4. So these are in bold. So you can see that in cluster design, the sampling variance is increased. Alright, so this brings us on to design effect. So design effect occurs in cluster sampling. It is the ratio of the sampling variance of the mean as observed in cluster sampling to the sampling variance of the mean that would have been obtained under the simple random sampling. It is a measure of the factor by which cluster sampling raises our sampling variance. Design effect is basically a measure of variance. Say we have a design effect of d square is equal to 3 here. So this implies that the sampling variance would increase due to cluster sampling by a factor of 3. or that the standard deviation would increase due to cluster sampling by a factor of 1.73 or 73%. Remember that the standard deviation is square root of variance. So in simple words, design effect tells us how different the clusters are from each other. Now you might be wondering if cluster sampling is increasing the standard deviation of a test statistic, then why do we use cluster sampling? Well again, as we said before, it is due to the cost factor. Putting together a large sampling frame can be time-consuming and costly. So this is basically a trade-off between cost and precision. Given the budget we have, 
some lost in precision may be acceptable to the investigators. Again, which sampling technique you would like to use should be informed by a study question. Say, if you want to study the mean body weight of nurses in the state, then I think it is okay to use cluster sampling. I don't think which hospital a nurse is working will have much influence over the nurse's weight. Then cluster sampling would be a smart thing to do. Now if you want to study the clinical outcome of a disease, say depression, then the outcome may vary quite a bit from hospital to hospital. And just selecting few hospitals and generalizing the result to the entire patients with depression may not be okay. Okay, now let us discuss design effect and rate of homogeneity and see how the two are related. One of my colleagues is working on Ebola in Sierra Leone and that made me actually think of using Ebola for an example here. Say through a cluster random sampling, we sample 4 villages out of 20 villages in a part of Sierra Leone to study the prevalence of Ebola. We do this by testing each, each individual in the selected villages for Ebola virus. Here are our 4 villages or 4 clusters. Here our design effect is basically a function of how different the villages are from each other in terms of prevalence of Ebola. It can be thought of as the between cluster correlation. If the prevalence of Ebola in one village is very high and in another village very low, then we have a big design effect. If you see from the other side, a greater difference in the prevalence of Ebola between the villages implies greater similarity or homogeneity of Ebola prevalence within that village. So this similarity within that village or within that cluster is called within cluster homogeneity or intra cluster homogeneity. It is also called rate of homogeneity or rho. If everyone in the village has the same disease status, then knowing the status of one individual is enough to know the status of the entire village. We do not need to determine the presence of Ebola in the other fellow villagers. So here, village B has an ICC of 1, which is perfect intracluster correlation, and village C also has an ICC of 1. Basically, everyone in village C has disease, and everyone in village B does not have disease. This equation gives you the design effect. It can be seen from the equation that design effect increases as a function of the row and the cluster sample size, that is the number of people in each cluster. Therefore, one way to reduce design effect is to take only a subsample of the elements in the cluster and not sample all the elements within that cluster. But then know that you will need to increase the number of clusters to maintain the overall sample size. The design effect is highest if both row is equal to 1 and when you sample all the elements within that cluster. This is the worst case scenario since the design effect, the d square, will be greatest in this scenario. So instead of taking all the elements within the cluster, if we subsample, then the design effect will be lower. However, then you will need to increase the total number of clusters and this will increase your cost. Alright, how do you calculate rho for a study that you are going to conduct or that you are yet to conduct? Because rho becomes available to you only after the study is conducted. That is, after the data is generated and you know the outcome. Therefore, to calculate design effect, you need to use rho that is calculated from a previous study in the same population or in a similar population. Then you can plug in the value of the rho from that study and then you get the design effect for this new study. And based on the design effect, you can adjust your sample size. We will see how to adjust sample size based on design effect later on when we study power and sample size. Here are some rules of thumb regarding the magnitude of design effect and intracluster correlation from your textbook. So design effect of 1 means there is no design effect from the cluster sampling and you do not have to adjust for the sample size due to design effect. If design effect is greater than 1, that means there is some loss in precision from that design effect. In other words, it can be thought of as some loss in sample size. So you need to adjust your sample size by multiplying the sample size by the design effect and then you'll get a new sample size. We will discuss this again in post-sample adjustment when we talk about power and sample size.
Well, I know that some of the topics may not be straightforward to understand, and I encourage you to go over the slides repeatedly and take time to think the concepts through. You can refer to your textbooks for topics that are unclear here, and I'm also happy to answer questions that you may have. Well, again, to remind you of the big picture, always think of this. So this is a simple diagram, but important. With this, we conclude our lecture series on population and sample. Thank you.